everyone, welcome to 5 Days of Vigan, where we will be making daily episodes in preparation of the DCS World AJS 37 Vigan, released by Leatherneck. This series will be a countdown to the release date of the aircraft this Friday, January 27th. Each episode will cover different aspects of the Vigan throughout its 30 years of service with the Swedish Air Force. Well, without further ado, here's Day 5, the history of the Vigan. To fully understand the Vigan, we must first take a look at where the Vigan all began its life, and how advancements led to the design. In 1937, the Swedish company Saab, the Swedish for Swedish Aeroplane Company Limited, was founded, and through the necessity that would become World War II, quickly started producing capable aircraft for the Swedish Air Force. Saab created the Saab 17, a single-engine bomber aircraft, in May of 1940. It would become the first aircraft Saab built for military service. During the war, Sweden would remain neutral, but would still have a large standing air force of over 800 aircraft to defend Sweden if attacked. During the war, Saab created a reputation for itself for building solid aircraft for the air force, so much so that from 1940, Saab would be the primary aircraft manufacturer for the military, producing both fighters, bombers, and trainers alike. Following the war, the air force would push for more modernization, and instead of waiting for Saab to advance and produce more modern fighter aircraft, they would instead purchase aircraft from the Allies, including the American P-51, as well as the British Mosquito. With the advancement of technology and introduction of the turbojet engine, Saab would have to kick it into gear to keep up with the times and invest heavily into R&D. What Saab produced would be known as the Saab 29, also known as the Flying Barrel, due to its unique shape. It would be the second turbojet aircraft that Saab produced, in its introduction in 1950, it would become known as one of the best performing fighters of its era. It would go on to best advanced aircraft such as the Royal Air Force's Vampire, an aircraft that was highly regarded for its time. And the Vampire can be pressurized to fly 50,000 feet up, the ace of British fighter aircraft. This aircraft would propel Saab to be one of the go-to manufacturers for high performance aircraft in Europe. As the Cold War began and the jet age erupted, the major powers would begin producing Mach 2.0 aircraft such as the F-104 Starfighter and the Soviet MiG-21. The Swedish Air Force were looking for an upgrade. Saab would be tasked in creating a fast jet that could both be used to intercept fast bombers at high altitudes as well as be used in strike missions. After various trials, Saab decided to go with a unique variation of the Delta Wing considered a double delta, which would become known as the Saab Draken. The Draken entered military service in 1960 and would be considered a great interceptor with its low drag airframe achieving speeds reaching Mach 2.0. The Draken would be one of the few airframes from Saab to be exported to other countries including the Austrian Air Force, the Finnish Air Force, and the Royal Danish Air Force. Towards the mid-60s, the Draken would become known as the most aerodynamically advanced fighter in the world. Although the Draken was considered a great success for Saab and the Swedish Air Force, the aircraft lacked capability as a strike aircraft. The Draken was only able to carry a small amount of ordnance with its limited hardpoints. The Swedish Air Force was quick to recognize this and would start researching an alternative aircraft to perform these strike missions shortly after the Draken was complete. The Air Force's requirements for this new aircraft were lengthy, and at the time, thought to be impossible to incorporate into a single airframe. The Air Force wanted a heavy strike aircraft capable of Mach 2.0, with capability for both standoff strike missions and close support. This new aircraft was to be light enough and powerful enough to take off with a full load from a short airstrip or improvised road runway as short as 500 meters long. Saab started drafting and had many designs, even considering a VTOL aircraft such as the Harrier. R&D was daunting and lengthy, but by the 1960s a breakthrough would propel Saab to finalize the design. In 1960, at the height of the Cold War, the U.S. began to reach out to Sweden as an ally and assist them as to put a buffer between the U.S. and the Soviets. This led the U.S. to formulate a military security guarantee with Sweden, thus creating a pact known as the 37th Annex which allowed the U.S. to share aeronautical technology with Sweden. 
This new pact would become a breakthrough for Saab, allowing them to access advanced U.S. technology and weapons to produce their next aircraft much faster and cheaper than before. In December of 1961, the Swedish government approved for the development of the Aircraft System 37, which allowed for spending and R&D for the Air Force's next aircraft. During this time, the project accounted for nearly 10% of Sweden's R&D funding and was a major development effort. By 1963, Saab had finalized the project and would begin building the first prototype, and by 1964, the Viggen was born. The first seven airworthy Viggen prototypes were rolled out of production for their maiden flight on February 8, 1967. The aircraft were to be tested against other contracts and to be put through their paces to see if it was the best aircraft for the job. Following the aircraft trials, the Swedish government concluded that the Viggen would be cheaper and superior to other aircraft such as the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom, an aircraft that was highly regarded as the best you could buy for your dollar at that time. The Swedish Air Force would immediately place an order for 175 AJ-37 Viggins that year. By July 1971, the first production AJ-37 Viggin would be delivered to the Swedish Air Force. It would quickly become a favorite amongst the pilots. The aircraft would become known for its levels of safety and reliability being well above expectations. The aircraft would excel in its low-level strike training missions and have met all the requirements set in place by the Air Force. Maintenance crew also loved the Viggen, as it was built for ease of maintenance and usability. So much so that the turnaround time took less than 10 minutes with a 9-man crew. The same procedure would take Western aircraft in excess of an hour to achieve. The Swedish Air Force were pleased with the success of the Viggen airframe, and by 1979 would roll out the JA-37, an all-weather interceptor variant of the Viggen, built with a brand new engine and new advanced radar-guided missiles. By the mid-1980s up to the late 1990s, the two primary variants of the Viggen were the main fighting force for the Swedish Air Force. The AJ-37 was later upgraded in 1993 with a new avionics package and renamed the AJS-37. This upgraded Viggen would serve until it was retired in the early thousands. While the Viggen would be fully retired by 2005, the Swedish Air Force still fly the aircraft for demonstration purposes. A slow pass here and an outstanding slow wing rock. The Viggen was a living memory of the jet era, and although it never saw combat, it was a legendary aircraft that won't be soon forgotten. Thanks for watching, and I hope you liked my little brief history lesson on the Viggen. If you enjoyed the series, I hope you stick around. We're going to start breaking down the Viggen into its individual aspects that make it such a legendary aircraft. Tomorrow is day four, which will go into the engine and the airframe of the Viggen. we got five days until we can be flying the Viggen in DCS world. I hope you guys are as excited as I am. This was the Werewolf, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.